So the, the title of what I want to share about today is, In All Its Glory, This Is New Thought. And I wanted to start off with um, a quote from Buddha that really kind of sums up what new thought is. And it says, believe nothing. This is Buddha 2,500 years ago. Believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Now, that's the way religion should be and should have been being taught for the last 2,000 years. Because that's what people that I find that have never stepped into a New Thought um, Center will say, I never knew there was a church that taught this. And it just makes sense. And that's what I always think and that's what I always value about New Thought is that it makes sense. But only to the point that it agrees with you. We never will say, here's how you have to believe. Well, I mean, on certain things, like, you know, <laughs> like I'm good looking, things like that. <laughs> I don't know. That's the best I can come up with on the moment. So, New Thought is a spiritual movement that was developed in the United States in the 19th century. The New Thought movement has its roots in American Christianity as well as metaphysical beliefs. And, and metaphysical simply means, meta, meta simply means beyond. So it just means not taking everything literally, but looking for a greater and deeper meaning. That's all that metaphysical means, looking beyond the current physical meaning of something. There are three major denominations associated with the New Thought movement. Religious science, which is what I was born and raised in. My, my mother, who I'll speak about, um, who, who heard Ernest Holmes, who I'll speak about in a moment, heard Ernest Holmes speak in Los Angeles, who was the founder of religious science in 1956. And then came, when we were living in Ventura, about 70 miles north of Los Angeles, she looked in the newspaper, and there was a, a, an announcement, a little small personal ads, um, for a study group on Ernest Holmes' teachings. And that's how most centers, pretty much ours was kind of started that way, a small group of people got together and started studying. And so um, the teachings. And it was meant to be, Ernest Holmes was friends with Bill Wilson, the founder of AA. And it was meant to be, um, religious science was meant to be an additional topic, an additional form of education to be taught within Christian churches. It was never meant to be a separate religion. And so you'll find, if for any of that have been in any of the AA programs, you'll find many similarities. And that's because each of them worked with each other grow, um, in the early 30s in Southern California. And so that's what my parents started at in a small study group, 10, 15 people. And within two years, they were able to buy a, purchase a church. It's a beautiful, still standing. And then I was born in 1960. My family was born and raised. All three of us were married in the church, et cetera, et cetera. And so in, um, that's where um, the connection comes as far as religious science. Um, Unity, there's a center here in town that's been here for 35 years, is the largest of the two denominations. And then the third and a smaller um, branch of New Thought is Church of Divine Science. It has about 5,000 members. The religious science that has just formally changed the organization's name about three years ago to the Centers for Spiritual Living. They finally figured out that the United Church of Religious Science or Religious Science International, which was the two branches of religious science, both started by Ernest Holmes, that the name didn't work very well. It actually worked against them. And you never want your name working against you. And the reason that it worked against them is now because of the bad name and bad reputation that Scientology has. And people immediately make the connection that don't have the understanding to Scientology. We have nothing to do with that. That's just like saying, does Victoria have anything to do with Miami, Florida? You know, they're totally separate cities, so totally separate branches. And then prior to that, Christian science, which is a new thought teaching, got, gained a bad name in that they didn't believe, they don't believe in going to doctors often. And so their kids, they would keep their kids home with the flu, temperature, and they would die because they believe everything should be healed through prayer and that somehow doctor, or that God doesn't work through doctors. I don't quite understand that one, but that's hardcore. Um, Christian scientists, and they finally have let off on that, but Christian science is dying out. The church here in town, big one, up on um, Pandora, um, has been taken over by the city. So um, they have fallen out of not able to keep it up financially um, a few months ago or about a year now. Um, so those are the three major branches, religious science, unity, and church of divine science. 
And there are smaller sects under the New Thought umbrella, along with many authors, philosophers, and individuals that share the same set of, of metaphysical beliefs, including our center. I'm, a, I'm an ordained minister in religious science. I spent five years studying between my church, and I drove for three years, four to five to six times a week, 125 miles down to Los Angeles from Ventura to gain my uh, ministerial degree. And I was taught by some of the finest teachers of metaphysics, the leader, or the number one teacher of the history of new thought in the universe, in, in United States is a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He drove the 110 miles down for um, two semesters to teach us the history of new thought. And so that's a lot of what I'm sharing with you comes from. And um, I was taught by professors at University of Southern California, Cal State Northridge, as well as Dr. Michael Beckwith that many of you have heard of. Um, probably the number one new thought minister right now in North America. Um, so um, the earliest founders, though, and proponents of the New Thought movement, and includes the, the, what's considered the father of New Thought, is Phineas Quimby. And Phineas Quimby is the first one that came up with the understanding that, that prayer, whether the, whether the person is present or absent, works the same. And so that's what begin to lead to that, wow, we must be all connected, that if I can pray for somebody here and they're living in Africa, or Australia, or the Soviet Union, and it can have the same impact as if I'm pay, pray, praying for somebody right up here as our CLPs, our Compassionate Listener and Prayers, do right after service that has the same impact. And that's what Quimby came up with. And Quimby was living in, in um, the New England area, and then he began to teach others. And some of the first others that he taught was Mary Baker Eddy, who is the founder of Christian Science, as well as Warren Felt Evans, who's considered, and I've quoted him many times over the last years here in the service, is one of the newest, uh, or one of the leaders and founders, early founders of New Thought, of the New Thought movement. And he was a proponent of Quimby's teachings, as well as the brothers Julius and Horatio Dresser, were both early leaders and authors and teachers in New Thought. And what they were practicing was Quimby's system of mental treatment of disease, which we now call affirmative prayer. And so those people were, were the main cores that started, and then some of those who they influenced then was Emma Curtis Hopkins. And Emma Curtis Hopkins should have a statue made out of her. She was one of the leading feminists of her time. She is the, one of the main reasons that in New Thought, since its origin, there has always, always been female ministers. They have, we have never, ever thought that this position should only be held by a male. Now that's huge, huge when we look at all the other denominations out there that still will not allow a woman to hold this space in a religion. So it's because of Emma Curtis Hopkins, who was an American spiritual author and leader, she was involved in the organizing of the New Thought movement and was a primary teacher, writer, feminist, mystic, and prophet who ordained hundreds of people, including women, at what she named, with no ties to Christian science, the Christian Science Theological Seminary of, of Chicago. Emma Curtis Hopkins was called the teacher of teachers. And who she influenced, and why I'm spending time on influencing, is because she influenced two, three other people that founded two other religions. One set is a husband and wife team called Charles and Myrtle Fillmore that founded the Unity Movement. There's about five to 600 churches of, of the Unity denomination in North America. There's about 13 or something like that here in Canada, I believe is about what the number is. And then the other person that she had a huge influence on was Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science. And there's a, now about 350, 400 centers of new thought, or of, of religious science, now called the Centers for Spiritual Living Around the World. So nowadays, though, the popular spiritual teachers that many of you perhaps may have read, know about, is Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra got his start, his big time start, in New Thought. That's where we first, we, all these authors that you see out there doing so well, they would speak in our churches. And they'd be recognized and they'd spread and spread and spread because we were the ones that would be open to their messages. Um, and so that's where I heard Deepak Chopra before, when he'd only put out one book, you know, that's a long time ago. <laughs> So the guy's a prolific writer, or his ghost writers are prolific, one or the other. And then Terry Cole Whitaker, a very famous TV evangelist, 
She was married, a little trivia note, she was married to, remember Captain Steuben from the Love Boat? That was her husband for several years until they didn't get along or whatever happened. But Terry Cole Whitaker in the 80s had a television show, was big time, big time before anyone ever heard of Michael Beckwith or Oprah or any of those, and wrote one of the very best books that I recommend for every person in the room is What You Think of Me is None of Your Business. It's none of my business. None of my business, pardon me. And then, as well as Schottky Gawain, Wayne Dyer, Neil Donald Welsh, you know, Conversations with God. Other teachers that are heavily influenced by the ideas of New Thought include Celestine Prophecy author James Redfield. I had one of James Redfield. He went to a little Unity Church in, I believe it was Arkansas. I had one of his original self-published Celestine Prophecies when it first came out, autographed by him, when he only published like 200 of them. Um, and there were so many um, clerical or, uh, or uh, um, mistakes, and it wasn't even funny, but then it spread. <laughs> and the, as well as the writers of the Course in Miracles that many um, New Thought churches study. And um, the main teacher of the Course in Miracles is Marianne Williamson. And many of us have seen her on CNN, on um, Oprah and that. As well as the number one Christian preacher in the United States and maybe in all of the world right now is Joel Osteen. Osteen. He meets in what was once the old Houston Rockets basketball um, um, the auditorium. And they have 17, 18,000 people on a Sunday on a regular basis. He's watched by over 8 million people a, a week. And what he is preaching is what I call Christian New Thought. He just throws in just a little bit about you need Jesus to be your Savior, and then you're all right. But here, let me tell you about really how to live. <laughs> And um, so those are the people that had the, the early influence as are, are part of the history and the foundation and the teachings of New Thought. And those who believe in New Thought or metaphysical concepts share a common concept of the power of positive thinking. And some of the major concepts include the law of circulation, cause and effect, affirmative prayer, and personal power that I'll touch on all today. New Thought ideals promote that there is an infinite intelligence or God that is the totality of all that is real, that the human experience is divine, that divine thought is a force for good, that all sickness originates in the mind, and that right thinking has a healing effect and impact in our areas of life. The basic, basic premise of new thought is this is as simple as it gets. God is good. That's it. God is good. And as I said, and I referenced it last week, if you don't believe that, just go sit out on Clover Point at sunset and watch it. God is good and very good. And it's based upon the principles of universal law as demonstrated and taught by historical figures such as Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and Latsu. Latsu, like that? That's how I say it. <laughs> New thought is inclusive and draws on the wisdom of all traditions that teach the truth of our unity, not our separation from or fear of or to live in fear of, of God. And that the good and the omnipresence of God as good. And so out of all of that, then we emerged as that is the foundation of it. And out of that emerged then our vision for our center, which is what we affirm on a regular basis here since we first started five years and three months ago. Not yet. The, the vision statement. The, the vision is, and, and let's read it together today, and then I want to just share with you what it really means to us, because it's so easy to gloss over the words, and we just read it in repetition, and it becomes something that we almost become immune to. But our vision is to be an environment. That means it's this room. This is our environment or any time that we come together, whether it's at a meal or whether it's, it's um, over serving Sandy Merriman Center or going to Africa, whatever, to be an environment that inspires each individual in the awakening, realization, and acceptance that we are divine expressions of God's holy love. And this right here is such a huge word except that we are divine expressions, and not to forget it. 
that when we wake up in the morning, we have the opportunity that we are blessed with each and every moment that we walk, that we breathe, that we think, to be an expression of love. And love is an incorporative word that includes many terms that we're going to put up here in a moment. But acceptance, that we are divine expressions. You see, if you accept that, you don't need to worry about all that self-esteem stuff because your self-esteem will go right through the roof because you understand that you are a divine expression and you've accepted it as your truth. As your truth. So that's what we're affirming there of God's holy love, of the purest form. And the purest form is innate to us. That's why it's so important that we connect and reawaken the inner child within us. Because it's innate. When you watch a little baby, as I have witnessed for the last five years, unfold, they are pure divine expressions of the human's ability to love in God's divine way. And that's who each of us are. And our purpose for why we are sitting here in this room is to drink coffee. (laughs) Our purpose. Our purpose, read this with me. To serve as a gathering and meeting place of the heart where we come to experience the divine life force of spirit, God, as it breathes into our soul, causing our thoughts and feelings to be awakened, thus empowering us to live life fully. Now, when we see breathing, you see, when we're looking at it literally, physically, we're thinking, okay, God's going like this. And for some of you, God's really frustrated, got a headache from blowing so much because we're like this. Right? We're going around with blind. It means we're not awakened to, wow. See, awakening is when we come to the point in our unfoldment, in our journey, that goes, wow, I'm connected to something more than my family's dysfunction. I'm connected to what has caused, I'm connected to what has caused the ocean to be here. I'm connected to those mountains across the little pond. I'm connected to all that is. That's the moment of awakening when you realize that you are more than just inside of your skin. That there's something inside of you that is connected to something greater than you. That's the moment of awakening. And when you accept that, then you become inspired, which is what our center is about. And and an inspiration, and what the word inspire means is a divine influence directly and immediately exerted upon the mind the mind or soul, to encourage or stimulate somebody to greater effort, enthusiasm, and creativity. That's what inspire means. So when we come to the center for inspired living, we are here to stimulate ourselves to be more than what we think we are. To live beyond our current and self-imposed limitations. To face our fears head on, to do things and look at, at face at things and look and ap- approach things that are bigger than us. <laughs> now, if we can inspire you to face your greatest fears, wow, what's that worth to you? So, the the in order for us to exist. Every living thing must be nourished. And our next image. Every moment of your existence and every breath you take, with every thought, emotion, and deed experienced, you are adding to or subtracting from the perfection of your true self. Every moment. How many moments like that in our life have we missed? So one of the foundations that we have continuously taught, and, and if you've been here for any length of time, you know sometimes I get real hot on a subject for a while, and then I wander away. Any of you been like that? <laughs> kind of like those that want to lose weight this year. You know you'll be really hot on it for a little while, <laughs> and then you kind of wander away from it. So, but this is what I've been really teaching through my workshops, Free the Heart, and especially Empowering the Authentic Self. But I've been teaching it for 25 years, and when Dre and I first started working together about eight years ago, 
he created this, and I've, I've always loved it and valued it because this is what is in, included or incorporates God's holy love. Let's put up authentic qualities. This is what the umbrella term, when we say God's holy love, to be expressions of that. This is what we're talking about. This is an authentic self. And we went through and, and gathered up some words, and we could probably put 500 more up there, or 1,000. I don't know how many there are in the dictionary that would define the true authenticity of who and what we are. But when we're expressing the fullness of our being, we're expressing some form, some shape, or a combination of many of these teachings, these words from vitality and compassion. We spent a whole year on compassion, openness, generosity, acceptance, morality, freedom, tolerance, hope, worthy, gratitude, kindness, awe, integrity, joy, forgiveness, nurturing, pure, happy, learning. We spent a whole year on happy, innocence, stability and many, many more. That's what it means to express the core of who we are often authentically. And when we do that, what we find is we feel good about ourselves. And others seem to migrate, seem to be drawn, seem, we seem to magnetize those to us when we're acting like this. Now, if you want to be alone a lot, be like this. Have you ever woke up in the morning and go, you know, I can't wait to go spend some time with my depressed, hostile, unsteady, suspicious, cold, ugly, boring, lazy, frugal, arrogant, judgmental, impatient, abused, aloof, compulsive, weak, and disconnected friend? <laughs> now this is what I have found, is that when we are being these things, usually life isn't flowing really well. But unfortunately, what most of us do is we think it's somebody else out there doing it to us. It's got to be somebody else, because it certainly can't be me. So what we're looking at is to be less like this. And this is what all of New Thought teachings are teaching us, trying to undo any false teachings that we've incorporated and ingrained and, drew, and, 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 become, and live from that we've gathered along our earth walk that cause us to be these things. Because uh, my child, the first five, when she came out of the womb, I didn't go, man, you look like you're going to be a disruptive, violent, abusive little girl. <laughs> but how many people have you ever said that about? That's what the lead news stories are often. So how the heck did we get that way? Come to Free the Heart and I'll show you. But this is what we're striving for, is to be more like this on a regular basis. That's what we're striving for. This is what it means to be on the path of awakening. When we're awakened, we begin to consciously become aware of when we're being like this versus when we're being like this. There is nothing more frustrating than to hang out with somebody on a regular, or let alone be married to them, that have no clue they're being those things. None. And that's what it means to live an unconscious life. So you see, what we're teaching here is how to be more conscious. And when we become more conscious through our awakening, then we go, wow, excuse, it might take you an hour, some, some, a week, to go, whoa, I was being a little hostile there, that moment of awakening. All right, so we also, on a regular basis, and, and we try to do it on the um, third Sunday of the month, and I don't know why it's come out that way, but it just has, where we read our Declaration of Beliefs. They're found on the website. I just want to cover those quickly with you and, and give you an image, a visual of what these things be. And, and these Declarations of Belief, I absolutely love them. These are the foundational principles that most um, New Thought Centers, I didn't write them, have posted on their websites or some variation of them that looks something like this. Our first one is, and read them with me. First one is, we believe in a loving and forgiving God. A God that is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and omniactive. And all that those omnis mean is omniscient, omni omnipotent means all-powerful. And omniscient means present. It's everywhere. And omniscient means all-knowing. And omniactive, I always love that one. It means it's always active, never goes to sleep. It's always moving, it's always going, creating, causing, and that. And the image that, that goes along with, with that, that fits so well in, is here is 
There's your universe, and man, have we spent time talking about the science of the universe and how we relate it. The God particle, one of the best talks I've given in here, showing you how we're all interconnected and what holds the God particle is what science believes is what holds the planets in place. And it's what makes us up. And it's incredible. And energy. And the universe that we're talking about, when we say God, we're saying the universe that contains 100 to 200 billion galaxies just like the Milky Way of 100 to 200 billion stars, moons, planets. And it's somewhere between around 97 billion light years across is what they're estimating. And it's expanding at a rate of 10% a year. That's when we say God, that's what we mean here. Okay? So for a long time, I know if, you, if you've always thought that God is this, this omnivalent presence up in, the uni, up in the heaven keeping track of you, it takes a while to be able to discern and be able to disconnect God, the word God to a supreme being to that. But you see, my child, as I grew up, never had to discern between the two. That's all that I've ever believed God to be. Ever. So when people go, oh, I fear, I fear God. Don't fear God. You can fear other people. God's doing nothing to you. God doesn't go, you're, when you think God is doing something to you, your ego is so whacked out, it's not even funny. <laughs> There's God. So the thing that created this immense universe picks you out of this little tiny planet that it would be like trying to pick a grain of sand out on some beach somewhere in the world and then t breaking that grain of sand into seven billion pieces. Because you understand, this is what science, to give you a big idea how big the universe is, science has told us that for every grain of sand found on all the beaches around the world, and you can hold a million grains in one hand, there is a hundred stars, planets, or moons for every grain of sand. Ponder that one. A hundred. So now whack one of those up into a hundredth piece of a grain of sand, whack that into seven billion parts. And that's you. Now out of that, God decided in its moments of omniactiveness <laughs> and omnipresence decided to make you have a bad day or the other team win. <laughs> right? Imagine the ego one has to have to believe that. So that's our first number one belief. Our second one. Now, I don't know. I could go on for five hours today. Image. Not, our, our next. Our next is we. We believe. Read this with me. We believe in equality and inclusiveness. That all people of all races, color, creed, gender, and sexual identity are created in the image and likeness of God. This has been a foundational teaching for the last 200 years in New Thought. And the Pope, the Pope just got man of the year because the, the Catholics of over a billion are starting to kind of come within 50 years of this teaching. Can you imagine? I performed my first gay wedding 23 years ago. First one. And now there's a thought that, wow, if you're seeking God, we're not going to keep you from inside, coming inside our church. Wow. Man of the year for Time Magazine. Isn't that sad? Now when they start speaking about it's okay to get a divorce and it's okay for a woman to hold this place in a Catholic church, then you got my attention. Everyone is created equal. And this is what I love. And we have practiced this from day one. From day one. That everyone is included in this room. I can't imagine the pain that goes on because you're gay or because of the color of your skin or because you got a divorce or because you're a woman that you're discredited and judged upon and, and, and excluded. What the hell kind of a religion can that be? That's hell. That's what it is. Next declaration. We believe in the freedom read to explore and embrace all religions and spiritual teachings. 
We understand that great truth and wisdom has been taught throughout the history of religion, mysticism, and spirituality. It means we take from the best. We don't just take from one person's perspective. We take from the best, and we try to incorporate and roll it on. So that means psychology. We're an amalgamation of, of, of science, psychology, philosophy, religion, and spiritual values and teachings. To me, that makes sense. Don't focus. Don't get so narrow-minded that there's only one way. So I love, and the image is, what, what, if you can read this really small, it, it has all the major religions woven in there. And you know what? All major religions, the sad thing is they all teach peace. But evidently, only if you follow their teachings. New thought is never taught that. New thought is always taught, be open, have an open mind. Find something that works with you and keep trying until it quits working. Then try something different. Makes sense. The next one. We believe that God's love is the most powerful spiritual force on earth and that it heals humanity's hurt, pain, and suffering. True. And you know, when I was preaching, and I wasn't positive about it until I went into the prison for the first time and took the workshop Free the Heart, which is based on the healing power of love, that heal, love can heal anything. And when I witnessed it melt hardened criminals, hardened convicts that have spent up to 48 years in prison, and when I watched it melt their heart, I didn't need convincing or need anyone else to remind me how powerful love is. I saw it in action. And if you don't believe love cannot heal anything, your ego is very small again. And it's keeping you from your own breakthroughs. Love is the most powerful healing force on earth. I don't care what's ever been done to you, what you've ever done to another, what you've ever done to yourself. Love can heal any of it. Any of it and all. There is nothing that I have not seen love be able to heal. Now, I've seen a lot of people block it out. But I've never seen love not be able to heal anything. Anything. I don't care if it's physical ailment. I don't care if it's the deepest emotional pain, and you will meet few people, fewer people, you'll meet very few people that have ever heard as much emotional pain as these ears have heard. I have heard some of the deepest, most horrific things that they're the things that CSI and criminal minds and all that make shows out of. That's what I've heard. And I could give them some stories that they've never used of what we have done to each other on this earth. If there's a sin, that's what it is, what we do to each other. And a sin is just simply missing the mark. It's making a mistake. And the mistakes we make on this earth on a regular basis is how we treat each other. That's what causes the hurt and pain and suffering in humanity. It's not God. Next one. God is simple. And it's found right there in John chapter 14, verse 16. Next one. We believe that the power of prayer can heal all false beliefs that prevent us from recognizing our true spiritual inheritance. It's true. And the next image comes up with it. It's so good. Prayer is a passion for the presence of God. You want to draw yourself closer? It's the greatest way to draw yourself closer to God. It can be simply, God bless me on this day. Thank you for all that you give me. I love you. That's prayer and having a passion for it, having a passion for it. If in this city, if we had as much passion for prayer and for growing and deepening our inner connection through prayer and meditation as we do for running and coffee, we would be unbelievable. We couldn't build churches fast enough. We couldn't build them fast enough. The next one, and this is what I've, I've always loved about our center, or new thought, is it's never said follow one teacher. You know, because you know the definition of a cult. You know, for years, we've been termed by many other teachings or, or religions as a cult. But they've never bothered to go look up the word cult in the dictionary. You know what cult is? It means to honor or worship or follow a, a living or dead person. That's the definition of a cult. We don't. <laughs> we don't. And, and, but we do follow the great spiritual teachers, and we aspire to be like them, to learn from them. See, it, it, I like golfing, and, and if you come for any length of time, you, you know it. And I like to, I'd like to be as good as the best golfers out there. But if I go, oh, I can't, because you're a professional. On any given day, I can hit play any hole as good as any golfer in the world. 
It's just I can't play all 18. <laughs> I'm good at about 14. I can play as good on 14, 13 holes when I'm playing all the time, as good as any golfer in the world. So you see, I aspire to be like them on those other five. But if I thought, oh, you, you, I can't even step on the golf course. I'm not even worthy to be on the golf course with you. I played with ex-professional golfers. Yeah, I am. I'm worthy. I sit right next to them and I tease them just as bad as I tease a, 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 hundred, a person that doesn't break a hundred. Everybody hits a bad shot. Everybody. And man, do you jump on it. But what I love is that we include the teachings, as it says, read with me. We believe that master spiritual teachers like Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, and those like them are the perfect examples to all people. They are the standard for which we strive every day to be more like. That's it. We're striving every day to be more like them. And the image, there they are. Well, or so we think. <laughs> we didn't have cameras back then. All right. So, the, the next, um, number seven is, we believe in the eternality of spirit, in the ever upward spiral of life after death. And in other words, see, what our basic belief is, you had to end, something inside of you had to end being where you were in order to get here. We believe in the eternality. We don't believe you start and stop with this lifetime. And we believe something goes forward. And they've actually been able to measure it, that when a body dies, it, it can change in weight. Very, very small amount, but it's been measured. And so we believe we continue on. So as I said, you had to cease being somewhere to get here. And you have to cease here to get there. Now, do you feel dead? So you had to cease being somewhere in order to get here. And in order to get to the next step, whatever it looks like, and God forbid, I hope it doesn't mean coming back here again. I hope it really is an upward spiral. This is the best I could come up with, is what looks like an upward spiral. And I just love, love the mosaic of all the different colored picture, or of the colored um, glass, stained glass. And finally, we believe that selfless service is a blessing of our awakened oneness. With all blessings, and that serving others without desiring anything in return is the blessing of selfless service. And we've had such a perfect example here of, of all the outpouring of goodness. We showed you a few pictures of all the stuff that all of you gathered over the holidays and that we gave to the Sandy Merriman Center. And here's the card that we just received back from the Sandy Merriman. And it's short but sweet. It says, thank you everyone for the wonderful donation of gift bags to the Sandy Merriman House. You brought smiles to many people's faces. Thank you from the director. So you see, people we don't even know are having a little bit better, a little bit better because of the generosity of who we are here as a center and what we stand for. So way to go, everybody. See, more than ever, we're being, or the next, the quote that goes with this. It's so simple, so simple. When love awakens in our heart, then selfless service is attained. As we will, as, as we are educating, uh, we've created a little building over in Africa. Most of us will never go there. That's educating 35 kids every day. And we're going to keep supporting. We're going to have our another fundraiser to continue the ongoing support of our little school in, 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 in Tanzania that have been so wonderfully fostered through so many of your outpouring of generosity. So the last couple things I want to share with you is one of the major teachings of New Thought is that there are science or spiritual laws out there, just like there are scientific laws, such as the law of gravity. And one of them is one that we've all known. It can be referred to as um, the law of karma or the law of cause and effect. It's the way it's most, or the law of karma in Hindus or Buddhism, or especially in Hindu. But the law of cause and effect is we would determine in the Western world. And this is why I want you to understand that all of our actions always can have an impact. And a lot of times we can't see the lasting impact, whether it's good or bad. And this is what happens when we come from our false qualities and, and the ripple effect that it causes. See if you've ever been caught in this chain. Jane, a bank executive, got caught in traffic on her way to an important presentation at a board of directors meeting. As a result, she was 45 minutes late for her presentation. After the meeting, Jane was in a really bad mood. Upon returning to her office, she discovered that several expected reports were not there. Jane called Kevin, her administrative assistant, into her office and reprimanded him for not ensuring the reports had arrived on time. 
Another department was preparing the reports. Kevin had no control over when they would be delivered. Jane was in a foul mood and she didn't want to hear any excuses. Upset and stressed, Kevin called Donna, the secretary for the department preparing the reports. He started yelling at her that the reports he had requested had not arrived. Although this was the first Donna had heard of the reports, Kevin didn't care. He was upset and took his anger out on Donna. By the time she got off the phone with Kevin, Donna was seething. Who did Kevin think he was speaking of her, of her like that? Just then, Ed from the mailroom called Donna to ask how she wanted a package shipped. Donna accused Ed of being an idiot for not knowing the package should be sent overnight because it was so important. Ed tried to explain there was no way he could have known what she wanted. Donna just slammed the phone down in a huff. Ed was livid. Did Donna think he was a mind reader? Ed was still agitated as he went to the diner for lunch. The diner was extremely busy. His waitress, Stacy, took longer than usual to take his order. Ed was annoyed with the slow service. He was rude to Stacy and left her a small tip. Stacy was running herself ragged and was offended by Ed's attitude and tip. The rest of Stacy's shift seemed to drag on. When she finally got off work, she was in a foul mood for any more she was in no mood for any more hassles from anyone. As Stacy walked into her apartment, her five-year-old son, Jimmy, ran excitedly to greet her. Stacy immediately noticed that Jimmy's pants were filthy. I just washed those, she yelled at him. Can't you keep anything clean? Jimmy ran up to his room. His cat came over to him, purring. Jimmy was so upset that he kicked the cat. Wouldn't it have saved a lot of time a lot, and a lot of people a lot of grief if Jane had gone directly to Stacy's house and kicked Jimmy's cat? So you see, what happens is when we're unconscious of the law of cause and effect, we have no way to understand the ripple effects that it can have. And it doesn't end just in a few moments, it can have generational impact. When I think of why we're sitting here doing yoga, one of the few centers in all of North America that incorporate yoga into its Sunday service to help attune your body along with your spirit and soul is because my mom started teaching in 1960. And it's evolved to such a point now that finally the Seattle Seahawks, the number one team in the foot, in National Football League, ha has mandatory yoga le um, in less sessions for its at football players. Wow, it only took them 60 years to get to it. So the ripple effects of how our actions can affect those that come after us. But when it all comes to, down, comes to the end, we are all truly at choice of how we want to start each day. And we'll go to, to um, the image number 13 in a moment. And it goes like this. Somebody has said that there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are those who wake up in the morning and say, good Lord, it's morning. And there are those who wake up in the morning and say, Good morning, Lord. So which one are you? Is it another day that you got to dredge through? Or trudge through? Or is it another day that you get to skip through? The choice is yours. And the purpose of our center is to inspire you to greet each day as a blessing. May we pray.